This is Radio TV Phono Nut, and we have a, a radio of unknown manufacture here. And I have the dial and the uh, dial basil and the knobs in a little Ziploc bag here. I bought this off of a gentleman on eBay, and he said that he recapped it, but it still wouldn't play. So now we get to try to see if we can make it play. Now, like I said, I can't find a brand name anywhere on this, but I suspect this may be a general television radio. I've seen some general television models that were in a cabinet identical to this, but all of those were five tube super hats. I think this one's a TRF set and contains only four tubes. But that don't mean nothing just because I haven't seen a four tube version. That certainly doesn't mean they don't exist. Here's the back here, as you can tell. I'd say this was probably made in the very late 30s, possibly early 40s, but I'm pretty sure it's pre war. I don't think this was made after the war ended. I'm starting to wonder if possibly this is a a chassis that someone shoved in this case because as, as you can see we have the chassis mounting thingamadoodles on the bottom but no uh, no holes on the bottom of the cabinet for chassis mounting and it looks like possibly someone might have cut away the sides here so where the chassis could be slid in and now that I'm trying to slide the chassis out the audio output transformer is hanging up on the top of the cabinet, not making it very easy to remove the chassis. So yeah, this may very well be a be a Franken radio. But I still want to try to get it playing anyway. And now that the chassis is removed, we can get a better look at the cutouts on the side of the cabinet that may or may not be factory I don't know I just need to try to do some research and see if I can find any general television radios with the same tube complement that this set has and that tube complement is 35Z5 rectifier 50L6 audio output tube 12SK7, I presume that's an RF amp, and then 12SQ7, assuming that's the right tube for that socket, would be the, the detector and first audio tube. But I need to look at this circuitry more carefully and see if this is truly a TRF or one of those four tube super heads that doesn't have an IF amplifier stage. Okay, this is our antenna coil that is tuned by this rear section of the tuning condenser. And let me go charge the battery. It's about to die on us. Well, I see my assistant is going to come help here. Well, I guess he decided not to help. Okay, I looked at every schematic on Nostalgia Air under General Television. And the models 411 and 421 are the closest thing i found that's similar, but not exact. Uh, that particular schematic is indeed a four-tube TRF circuit. But instead of a 12SK7, they use a 12K7. The chassis layout is not exactly the same. And on their, on their radio, the... Well, I looked up a picture on the internet of the radio, and the controls on that set are oriented vertically, where on this set they're oriented horizontally. So I don't know. I mean, this could still be a general television chassis that's just not listed in riders or anywhere, so I, I just don't know. Now, looking at the chassis... This is a hot chassis set, meaning one side of the line is connected directly to the chassis. Oddly enough, I only see one filter capacitor here and 80 microfarad, and that's strange. I don't think I've ever seen that in a radio. Every radio I've ever worked on used a Pi-type filter, 
network, which means it has, it has uh, two filter capacitors with either a choke or a resistor in the middle. This one only has one filter, but looking at this old retaining clamp here, you can see it's kind of small, so this set might have been so cheap that it might have only had one filter in it to begin with. We have what looks like some sort of big choke choke here that connects between the chassis which is ground and this wire has come loose so I assume it connected here to the power switch. Yeah this is kind of a weird little radio. Okay a gentleman on the uh, antique radio Facebook group posted a picture of a chassis just like this one that he owns that's in a he said is in a different cabinet but but he didn't show me the cabinet I uh, still don't really think much about that because it's not unusual for the same chassis to be used in a variety of different cabinets however his chassis did not include this thing here it did however include this empty space where another tube socket would have gone but uh, I'll have to look at his closer and see if this was cut out here on the side. I'm not sure it was. So, I don't know what we got here. This tube socket has been replaced. His set, like this one, only had one filter capacitor. Except in his, I think he had two 47s in parallel to get the close to the, uh, well, actually it'd be closer to 100 than 80, but, you know, it, no big deal probably all right let's see if we can determine what this doodad is and see what we need to do with it well whatever it is it's reading 950 ohms so we're going to leave that out of the circuit for a while and we're just going to see if the the radio has continuity across the filament string and if it does then we will go from there and we'll do it just like we do any other radio. We'll just work our way through it until we get it going. Okay, we're getting 159 ohms across the power plug, so we at least have filament strain continuity. Now I think we'll plug this into the power supply and bring it up very slowly and see where we need to go from there. Okay, I'm feeding the chassis with about 60 volts AC, and it's warming up. I'm monitoring the B-plus voltage at the filter capacitor, and I've only got, oh, roughly 10 volts here. Now, I realize we're running this at about half the normal line voltage, but uh, there should still be... I do believe there should be more than 10 volts there. Now our current draw is not excessive, so that's a good thing. I'll crank it up just a little bit and see what happens. I cranked it up just uh, about 10 volts and it only brought it up to about 11 volts B plus, so I think we need to look in our power supply for starters. But right now I'm going to kill the power and let everything discharge. And even though we weren't drawing excessive current, I'm going to check the resistance from the B plus line to ground and see what we get there. Well, we're not getting an excessive, excessively low reading. In fact, we're not getting anything at all. So. Let's look at the power supply and see what's up with that. Okay, I discovered we have a high resistance ground return on the B minus line, so that's why the voltage was extremely low. Now we got about 50 volts going in the radio, and we have about 57 volts B plus, so that's a lot more impressive. Still not really hearing anything out of the speaker, so we'll crank it up to about 60 and let it warm up a bit. Still not drawing any excessive current draw, so that's a good sign. Okay, I'm starting to hear some hum from the speaker now. 
I think volume is wide open. I don't even think this tuning dial is turning. Hang on. Okay, I have the outside antenna connected and we're hitting it with about 60 volts. Had to manually turn this tuning condenser because it looks like the string is loose. What was that, 1390 just barely coming in and all right there's MOX. Let me bring it up a little higher. Bring the AC up a bit higher. Okay, there we are at 120 volts. That thing's still humming like a son of a gun. I really think this needs two filter capacitors. Uh, like I said, we don't know exactly what this is as far as a make and model number. And I may just have to draw out a schematic of what's here and work from there, but you know, it's a good sign we're uh, passing gas, but it could be a lot better, even for a cheap TRF set. But you can hear with the volume all the way down, the hum, and that's indicative of either a failing power supply or a heater to cathode short in a tube. Uh, mainly the audio output to you, but I think it's a power supply issue. I think it needs another filter capacitor in there. And I mean, even though it looked like the chassis I was seeing on the internet only had one cap too, but you know how looking at pictures sometimes are, you don't get the whole thing, so it might have actually had two capacitors going to two different points, but in the picture it looked like two capacitors in parallel. Okay, I'm looking here and they have the output tube cathode grounded directly to the chassis. And this may be a case where this ground is elevated after all. That was especially common in some 30 sets where they would elevate the ground and the chassis would be your where you get your bias voltage for the output tube cathode. So we're going to have to look at this some more. There might actually be supposed to be a resistor between our filter capacitor ground and chassis here. But as you can see, they have the cap going to the chassis, but that may or may not be correct. We're just going to have to dig into this and see. Okay, here's what we need to do, I believe. This, this large inductor here that reads 900 and something ohms, we need to connect that between our circuit ground here that's on the switch, and of course the other end is already connected to the chassis. And then we need to remove the filter capacitor ground here where they have it grounded to the chassis and move it over here to this switch here which is circuit ground and I feel like the reason they're using a big inductor instead of a resistor between chassis and circuit ground here is for RF filtering to keep any RF off of the chassis itself here so let's make that little circuit modification and see if this thing behaves better. Okay, we have the one side of the inductor temporarily connected to the switch. The other side connected to the chassis. And then we temporarily have our negative lead of the filter capacitor connected between the, well, obviously the filter capacitor itself and the other side of our switch here. So let's energize this joker up and see what it does. Okay, well that got rid of the hum and we get a little static when I turn the 
volume control, but no stations, unfortunately, so we're going to have to go over this probably tomorrow whenever it's getting kind of late tonight, but I want to go over this. There may be some some biasing that's required for the previous stages in this radio. I just think this is a case of one that's been boogered with, and we're going to have to unbooger it. Oh, and by the way, I did look at the schematic of the General Television Model 411, and it's more of a conventional circuit that uses a pie-type filter that's it's referenced to circuit ground. You know, it's chassis and all, it's circuit ground, none of this oddball floating chassis business to get bias voltage. And I looked on eBay and found a picture of a completed auction of a general industry, or excuse me, general television. I'm thinking about general industry's phonograph motors, but a general television radio that uses a cabinet identical to what we've got. Only that cabinet on the sides where my cabinet has the wider cutouts, this cabinet has a more narrow cutout for the chassis to slide in. And it's a five tube standard super hit from like 1948. But there again, it's very possible this cabinet could have been one that they carried over from before the war. That's not unheard of with radio manufacturers. So, you know, this could very well be a pre-war model that uses a different chassis. The dial and pointer sort of resemble the later general television models, so that's why I'm thinking this may actually be a general television set that's the correct chassis for the cabinet, but, you know, I don't know 100%. Okay, so this coil here was too much resistance. It was giving us too much voltage on the cathode. I experimented with some resistor values and I went with a 100 ohm resistor between the between B minus and chassis and that got our volume back, our reception back, but as you can hear we still have too much hum so I think we're going to have to add another filter cap somewhere in the circuit to get rid of that. Okay, I really don't know what's going on here. Like I've already said, this radio is one that's been heavily hacked on over the years. I can't find any schematic that looks like this chassis. So I guess I'm going to have to do my own redesigning here. And I think a good place to start would be installing a Pi-type filter network right about here on a terminal strip. And then we can go from there. And what we'll do, we'll use a, like I said, a Pi-type filter with the 80 microfarad being our input filter right off of the cathode or the rectifier and we'll throw about a 1k ohm resistor in between the two filters. Coming off of the first filter will be our uh, high higher voltage for the audio output transformer. And then coming off the second filter we'll go to the screen grid of the audio output tube. And there's also resistors coming off at that point feeding the other stages in the radio. I think that would be the be a good place to start with this. Okay, here we are with a new Pi type filter network in place. We use the 80 microfarad that he used for the input with a 1500 ohm resistor in the middle and a 33 microfarad going out. So, so yeah, we have our output transformer primary connected to the first filter and then coming off of the second filter is the screen grid of the audio output tube and everything else. Now it really ain't much better than it was to start with and I think we have an intermittent tube to boot. Bad people already carry guns. All you're doing is...
carry guns in these places. Turn the volume down. I think our output tube is probably cream puffed. So I need to dig around and find another 50L6. We obviously still have problems. We shouldn't have all that humming, which leads me to believe we still have grounding issues. And after I've already created that pie type filter, I'm not going to go ripping everything out and going back to like it was. I'll just redesign this thing based on, a, on another schematic and be done with it. Okay, I'm in the process of redoing the audio output stage, and then we'll work our way back. Uh, this may not look the best in the world, but it certainly didn't look the best in the world before either. So what I've done, we're using the chassis for circuit ground, as in one side of the AC line will be connected directly to the chassis here. Uh used a standard 150 ohm cathode bias resistor for the output tube with a 22 microfarad cap in parallel with that. Then we used a 0 0.02 microfarad cap between the plate and the cathode. That's pretty much standard. It helps shape the tonal quality and it also keeps any RF that might be present on the plate shunts that off so there won't be any arcing or oscillation going on within the tube or audio output stage in general. Okay, uh, we have a 470K going from the grid of the output tube to ground. That's pretty much standard. The resistor in here, well, what did I do with it? It was one of these dog bone style. It was like a 250K. Uh, Here's the coupling capacitor that go from the plate of the first audio and detector tube to, to the uh, control grid of the output tube. The other one was in here kind of sloppy and the leads were kind of too short. So we're just going to replace the whole thing. Here's the plate load resistor for the first audio tube. One end connects to the screen grid of the output tube. And then the other end, of course, connects to the plate of this first audio tube as I was trying to get it out one of the leads broke off but that's no problem I think the leads are plenty long enough so we're going to check the resistor and make sure it's good and if it is we'll reuse it if it's not we've got some 470 K's we can use all right here's something here that's a little puzzling they have a capacitor here it was connected between the plate of the first audio and detector tube and ground. Now generally that's a low value capacitor, say no bigger than 0 0.005 microfarad. And its purpose is to pull any RF that's on the plate of that tube off the ground. If that capacitor is not there, you'll have some undesirable oscillation taking place. So let's see, what is this thing here? Let me try to get in here and see it. Try the zoom feature on this camera. Come on there. Let's see if it's going to focus for us. Maybe not. Let's get out and redo this. Hang on. Okay, maybe not. I'm still kind of getting... Yeah, I'm still kind of getting the hang of this camera, but I think this is a, I can't really see it well through here, but I think it's a 0.1 microfarad in parallel with a disc capacitor of unknown value. I'm really thinking that's probably too big for this application. That's going to shunt a good bit of your audio to ground. Not only just RF, it'll reach up into the It'll reach down into the audio spectrum too, so 
I'm probably going to have to change that cap as well. Okay, sorry about that, but this is a 330 picofarad capacitor in parallel with a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, so uh, the 330 might be appropriate for that spot, but at this time, I just don't think the 0.1 is. I might be proven wrong later, but I just don't think that needs to be there in that application. Alright, we're improving, but we still have a long way to go. As you can tell, our volume is louder now. But we still got some hum there that I don't know why we have that unless this output tube is developing a heater to cathode short. It doesn't seem to be vibration sensitive like it was before. Well, you know, it might get you know it might get louder if we were tuned to the station, but this tuning string is bound up and it's restricting the flow of movement of the tuning condenser here. Now, like most of these TRF sets, the volume control is not in the audio circuit. It's in the uh, it's in the front end, the RF amplifier stage. But they're also known for their many health problems. Their genetic predisposition to hip dysplasia, combined with their wide shoulders and low slung bodies, makes mobility difficult for these dogs. Bulldogs have severe breathing difficulties and have an increased risk of related deaths. Most bulldogs also suffer from eye and ear issues as well as allergic reactions. But the most obvious sign of how... Alright, we're getting there with this. Now the next thing we need to do is figure out what's going on with this hum situation here. But with that, I think I'm going to go up for tonight because over the past hour or so, I've heard a multitude of gunshots in the area. You know, that's what my neighborhood is pretty much turned into and you know, 30, 40 years ago this sort of thing wasn't even a thought. You knew all your neighbors, you could trust them all and if you needed help they'd help you. If they needed help they knew you would help them. That's just the way it should be but it's not that way anymore unfortunately. Uh, same thing happened to my neighborhood. It's happened to so many others. The older folks passed away or moved on and the riffraff moved in and that was that. So I think I'm going to call it a day for tonight because I don't I don't want to be uh, needing the bambulance or worse than that the uh, what was it that the, the old folks used to call the the vehicle that came to get the bodies the the meat wagon we don't we don't need that either so so yeah, we're making progress with the radio, but we still got a ways to go on it. So here we are. There's our coupling capacitor in place. Our plate load resistor. The other one was up to like 720K when it was supposed to be 500. So I just went ahead and changed it with a 470. And then we got rid of that big 0.1 capacitor and replaced it with a 500 picofarad bypass capacitor between the plate of the RF, uh, excuse me, the detector and first audio tube and ground. So that will shunt off any RF to ground and leave the audio alone. This is the wire that I'd put in place first to run the switch over to the negative terminal of my filter capacitor whenever I was sticking with the way it was designed when I got the radio, but since we're using the chassis as ground now, I can get rid of this wire and just run a jumper from there to chassis, and that'll look neater. This resistor here was what they had, the grid bias resistor for the output tube. Uh, they had it going over here to the 
detector tube. I don't know what this is all about, but it's not going to ground anyway. But we'll come down here tomorrow and do some more to this. And once we get the hum taken care of and get the tuning string straightened out, then this radio ought to be uh, good to go. Okay, in trying to locate what's causing the hum, we have the volume all the way down and it's still humming. So, like I think I said earlier in the video, that tells us that it's either in the power supply or the uh, audio output stage. Okay, we have the meter set to measure AC volts, and I'm going to see what we have here on the first filter capacitor. About 1.8 volts. That's unacceptable. So that would lead me to believe one of these filter capacitors is bad, or we may have a leaky rectifier tube, or an output tube that has a cathode to heater short. Okay, I jumped a uh, filter capacitor across the one that was in the radio because I failed to check that one and apparently it's good because the hum didn't go away any. So, now let's move to the rectifier tube. Oh yeah, when I said humming with the volume all the way down, I don't know what I was thinking. I was thinking about more conventional radios with the volume control and the audio circuit, so... In a set like this, where the volume control is in the front end, uh, controlling the gain of the first RF amplifier tube, or the only RF amplifier tube, then yeah, it's going to hum regardless. So, you know, pretty much it could be a heater to cathode short in any tube doing this. So, the best way to tell is just by substitution, and we're just going to substitute the tubes one at a time and see if one of them makes a difference. Okay, so it's not the rectifier tube. And it's not the 12SQ7. And it's not the 12SK7 because whenever I pull it, the hum still remains while the, uh, while the tubes, uh, while the output tube and rectifier cool down. So it's not the problem there. And I pulled the 12SQ7, and no problem with that stage. The hum faded away as the other tubes cooled. And I had the hum abruptly went away whenever I pulled the 12SQ7, and that would have indicated a problem in that stage. Now, when I pull the output or the rectifier tube, of course, the hum is going to abruptly go away because that affects the the output audio output stage and the power supply so but I do believe the trouble is in those stages somewhere something is leaky and allowing some ripple to get through and I jumped out the second filter the one from my stash and as you can tell no nothing has changed okay not that this would have anything to do with it I was looking at the connecting wire between the filament side where the AC comes in and the plate of the rectifier tube and it looks sloppy so I said what the heck I might as well go ahead and take that off to neaten that up a bit and then I noticed down here the cathode of the rectifier another wire connected to it this is where they're running voltage to the screen grid of the RF amplifier tube and it's providing B plus for the RF amplifier stage and I really think we should probably remove that wire and move it over here to the second filter capacitor and see what that'll do. Okay I went ahead and replaced that jumper wire and installed a better conditioned power cord. The other one was getting kind of hard and I see what the problem is now. I disconnected this lead that was connected to the cathode of the rectifier. And if we trace this lead around, it goes to the screen grid of the RF amplifier tube. And then it goes around back over to one of these coils. And then it goes around back over to, to the screen grid of the audio output tube. 
And then from the screen grid of the audio output tube, it comes around here to the second filter capacitor. Well, with this lead connected to the cathode of the rectifier, that was placing a short across this resistor here, this 1.5K resistor. So effectively giving us only one filter capacitor. So now with this lead out of the way, we're going to fire it up again and see if the hum goes away. I bet it does. Okay, the hum is now greatly diminished to a level in which we can live with. Markets, many of whom are listening to this radio show. So I get it. I'm as frustrated and tired of it as you are. And it's now working. So now what we need to do is clean up some of this other mess and fix the dial string. And then we ought to be ready to put this radio back together. And once again, I don't know how this radio was originally wired from the factory because we're not 100% sure what brand the set even is. Like I said earlier, I suspect it's a general television, but I can't find any exact match for a schematic for a radio that was wired like I found this one. So what I'm doing to this is strictly, I'm strictly doing some educated guessing here. And apparently everything I'm doing is must be close to right because the radio seems to be working. All right, let me continue the clean up and then we will fix the dial and then hopefully that will be the end of it. All right, looking at this a bit closer, this looks like the electromagnetic portion of an old contactor that somebody tore apart or some kind of something or another relay solenoid something I don't know but I could tell by the soldering which wasn't very good that this wasn't a factory installed part now why somebody installed it I have no earthly idea and the battery's fixing to die so we're going to have to cut it off and go charge the battery but it's now removed from the circuit okay we got it cleaned up a little bit under here I uh, added a across the line capacitor for the uh, RF across the AC power line for RF noise suppression and cleaned up some of this other stuff. This resistor here was one that someone had apparently had been monkeying with and they broke off the lead so they connected a piece of uh, old component lead to it to to be able to still use it. Now the resistor was fine as far as the value of it, but I decided to go ahead and replace it with a new resistor so it would look neater. And I took out that jumper wire that I had here. I just ran a jumper from here to the chassis here to make the ground connection. And of course got rid of this old whatever this crap is, this old part of an old contactor or something. I don't know what they had that in there for, but it's gone now. And then I replaced the old rotten antenna wire with a new one, as well as the isolation capacitor. Now originally this would have had 25 or 30 feet of wire wrapped around a cardboard form that they expected you to unwind and stretch across the room. Uh, I didn't use that much wire on here, but of course we can connect it to a longer antenna if needed. And it really needs to be connected to a longer antenna because these types of radios are not very good performers. It's basically an updated circuit using octal tubes with higher voltage filaments from the old circuits from the 1930s. Uh, those little four tube radios with the ballast tube or the resistance line cord. It's basically the same circuit as that, just with updated tube types. Now, as far as TRF radios, they were very popular in the 1920s, and some of them were good performers because they had two to three, sometimes even four stages of RF amplification ahead, ahead of the uh, detector stage. 
but by about 1931-32, the super hit circuit had pretty much taken over because, you know, RCA released the released the patents on their super hit design, and that allowed other companies to manufacture them. So pretty much after about 1931-32, about the only TRF sets you were going to find were these little cheap, low-performing, what's often called city radios, because they're basically only good for strong local radio stations, and that's even with a good antenna. And believe it or not, those little TRF designs, cheap designs, still hung around into the 1950s. Not much, but they were still around. All we need to do now is restring the dial, and I don't even have any string here, so I'm not even going to worry about that in this video. I mean, you get the idea. And I've got to replace this bulb. This set was so cheap, they, they didn't even give you a, a socket to attach the bulb to. They had the bulb soldered in place in the chassis that the gentleman on the uh, antique radio group showed is the same way. So, you know, just a cheap design there. So, electronically we need to restring the dial, which is something I hate, even on these little simple point A to point B type of arrangements. I need to get a light bulb, and that should take care of the chassis. Now, the speaker had some crap in the air gap, so I just simply tuned it to 1390, which is that very powerful gospel station, laid the radio on its face, and let it play wide open for a few minutes, and that knocked all of the uh, crud out of the air gap there. So yeah, like I said, electronically all that needs to be done to this is the bulb needs to be changed and the tuner needs to be restrung and cosmetically I need to glue the cabinet back together, but I'm not even I'm not even going to worry about all that in this video. I'll show you that the radio plays and then I'm cutting it. Oh, hang on. Got a little too carried away there, starting to get a little reminiscent of the old camera always being out of focus. Alright, this is on 910, the Black Gospel Station. And we're connected to the outdoor antenna, which is probably about, I don't know, 30 or 35 feet long. Airlines 800-215-5141 That's 800-215 Now remember the volume control is in the uh, front end. It's not in the audio stage. And it's basically only effective on most stations for about the top three quarters of its rotation. And again, that's normal for these types of radios unless you have a a very strong flame flower flame thrower that you're sitting on top of. It's taken from the pipeline in Escanaba, Michigan. From the West Coast of USA, Radio News Bureau, I'm Lance Pry. Former Director of National Intelligence John Radcliffe joined Maria Bartiroma on Sunday morning futures. D and I Radcliffe told It's trying to bring in some distant stations, but nothing really discernible. Like I've already said, these are basically meant for local reception, so you're not going to get a lot in the way of out-of-town stations on them, even at night with a good antenna. I think even those little four-tube Arvin Superheads were better performers than these little TRF sets were. For USA Radio News, I'm Greg. This is Meridian's News Talk Station, AM 1010, WMOX. And another disadvantage of these little cheap radios is the selectivity generally sucks on them. 
here we are below 910 and I'm even hearing some 1010 coming in there so and now we're starting to slide into 1390 which is the the very overmodulated southern gospel station and I hear some Aretha Franklin trying to slip in on us so Now this station's so powerful that this is basically the only exception to the final three quarters of the uh, volume control rotation rule. That's 1450, but even if you wanted to listen to it, you can't get much out of it because 1390 is blowing its way on top of it, which again, I, that's pretty much what I run into with every radio with this type of circuit, so nothing to get alarmed about there. It does appear to be more sensitive towards the high end of the dial, but still not really good for much. And also, these types of radios tend to sound a bit tinny. Once again, that's that's normal for these. They really didn't make any effort to make them sound decent. These were cheap dime store radios, and they pretty much made them as cheaply as possible and blowed them out the door. Of course, the difference between this dime store junk and the junk being made today is this junk from the late 30s can usually still be repaired this junk they make today is pretty much landfill material whenever it needs service or whether or not you were somebody voted for donald trump who felt that way about uh, joe biden taking office okay that's that's about all i've got for this radio like i said i'm not gonna i don't have any dial string handy nor do i have any light bulbs so I think I'm going to call it a day on this one. And this light bulb is kind of an oddball. It has a flange on it, as you can see, to keep it from being pushed through the, the front of the dial. Now, when this was new, this rubber grommet would hold the bulb in place, but after 70 plus, 70 or 80 years, this rubber has kind of shrunk and deformed, and it doesn't hold the bulb in place as good as it once did, but... But yep, that's about all I've got for this. And uh, we'll get them next time. We'll uh, we'll win the next time out. Uh, lacking that consensus, so you in fact have a society that's on the very brink of disintegration. Have we heard any W Vax on here yet? I'm not sure if we if we heard any W Vax in this video. I'm not sure if we have or not. I don't. I don't really remember. But yeah, this string is just old and stretched and needs to be replaced. And of course, really don't need to restring it that bad because if I ever play this, it'll be on WMOX for what that's worth and... That's where it's tuned right now, so 
and that station is only a shadow of what it used to be. I mean, even as a talk station, they were better than they are now, but all of the talkers seem like moved to a couple of different FM stations. Well, when WMOX flipped to talk in about 94 or 5, well, actually, they started making the transition in 1989 when they took on Rush Limbaugh, and then from 89 to about 94 or 5, the the amount of music kept getting less and less and the amount of yapping got more and more until they just done away with the music format altogether and switched to talk. And from about 94 or 5 until the early, probably early 2000s, they were the only talk station in the area. And then 910 WALT, they went from R&B and rap and hip-hop to black gospel very briefly and then they went to talk radio so that gave us two talk radio stations on AM and that's the way it was around here for years and then on FM we had a station that went through a couple of music formats and then they went to super talk and then 102.1 which was owned by the same family who owned 910 ALT dropped their music format and just simply started simulcasting the talk format on WALT and then within the past couple of years I don't, I don't know what happened but I don't know whether 910 was sold or 102.1 was sold but they ended up breaking off from 1021 ended up breaking off from 910 and and then that's when 910 changed the call letters to WMOG and went black gospel and 102.1 and 10 is still talk under WALT and then 103.1 or 3 or whatever it is is still super talk Mississippi and that's between those two stations, that's where pretty much all of the, the talkers have gone. All of the programming that used to be on WMOX are now on the FM dial. And pretty much all you have on WMOX is their morning show, which is only a shadow of what it used to be. And then a few hours of Mike Gallagher in the daytime, and then Fox Sports in the afternoon. Which, by the way, you can hear the same Fox Sports programming on another station that's owned by different people and has basically the same coverage area. So, why WMOX chooses to run something that another station, another competing station runs, is beyond me. And then when the sports goes off, it's Dave Ramsey and then after Dave Ramsey, it's whatever whatever this is for the rest of the night. Jim Bohannon, I believe. And that's, that's really about it. And on the weekends, it's pretty much all sports except for the church services they run on Sunday morning. And, and you know, that's pretty much about it. I really don't see how they're hanging on, but... And I hope they can continue to hang on, but I, I just don't know. But these, these cases don't really, the media doesn't cover them anymore. We used to have the papers like the Miami Herald, the Cleveland Prime Dealer, win Pulitzer Prizes for uncovering voter fraud, Chicago Tribune. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. My point is this, a prosecutor... But yeah, you could, connect, you could connect an antenna to this, and you know, if you liked listening to something on your local AM stations, then... It'd be good for that, but not much of nothing else, unfortunately. Now, I'm through babbling on now. I'm going to hit the stop button, and more to come later.